Hello, everyone, and welcome to your virtual 2021 Autism Alliance of Michigan Hero Walk. My name is Joe Omachinski, and I am going to be your guide to all the animals here at the Potter Park Zoo. Just a little background about me. I graduated from Michigan State University with a Bachelor of Science in Zoology in December of 2018 and been involved in animals for as long as I can remember. I've always loved animals and I find the animal world very fascinating and I'm always happy to share my knowledge with everyone here. So without further ado, let's go to the zoo. All right, so our first stop of the day is um, the North American River Otter Habitat. Here you will see um, our, the three river otters that are out and about. We've got Mom Nikiki and her two pups. Now, river otters are definitely a built for life uh, playing in the water. They have their long water uh, repellent fur and a long body. So if you see them swim, it's truly a sight to behold. They're like natural acrobat swimmers. Being aquatic mammals, um, in the wild, these guys would eat anything from fish to shellfish to crustaceans, even small turtles. And here at the Potter Park Zoo, they're given a diet mainly of fish. These next animals are quite possibly one of my favorite birds in the world. They are Magellanic penguins. Now, when you hear the word penguin, probably the first thing that comes to mind is cold, forbidding environments that are full of ice and snow. Well, actually, the vast majority of penguin species thrive in warm habitats such as these guys. The Magellanic penguin is found uh, throughout southern Argentina and Chile, and they don't need to worry about, uh, about cold environments. They're quite at home there. Now, with all marine bird species, these guys primarily feed on fish. Here at the Potter Park Zoo, they're given um, a special kind of fish called capelin every day. And when they eat fish, they actually don't need to chew it. They've got a special forked tongue that will immediately um, grab the fish and then uh, prevent it from ever trying to escape its beak. You don't want to be on the receiving end of that if you were a fish. Now here at the zoo, you can see we've got a special uh, jacuzzi going, but uh, don't expect any warm-ups in there. It's um, perfectly temperature controlled for them to swim in. And plus by bubbling uh, the water, it also uh, prevents it from freezing over, especially in the winter months. Do all penguins engage in secret espionage operations? Oh, certainly not. You know, what you see in Madagascar is completely imaginative. These guys, I guarantee you, are not, um, are not part of any movement. They will, um, they will just stay where they are. Well, welcome to the farm, everybody. And you're about to meet some creatures that I consider the greatest of all time. Goats, to be exact. Behind me, we have African pygmy goats. And pygmy goats are typically kept as, as pets for hobby farms or even just um, as indoor, indoor goats. Yeah, I, yeah, it's true. A lot of people do uh, potty train their goats. And yeah, it's kind of funny when you think about it. Now, the thing about goats is that uh, these animals have been domesticated for far longer than, than any other domestic animal, even longer than horses or sheep or even, even camels for that matter. Now, one thing I really love about them is their beards. <laughs> even the females have beards, so <laughs> it's kind of funny now that, you think, now that you think about it. But nonetheless, um, I'd say that goats are definitely one of my favorite uh, domestic animals out there. Before I talk about this next animal, uh, please excuse the noise in the background. Construction is going on at the zoo and a lot of new improvements are coming. But construction aside, I'm now, I'll now tell you about the pride of the Potter Park Zoo. And I do mean pride because that is what a group of lions is called. Here at the Potter Park Zoo, Dakota, or the male lion, leads a pride of two females, Ulana and Saida. 
Normally, a pride consists of one dominant male and then multiple females and their offspring or cubs. Now, when it comes to getting food, that's the job of the females. The, the male lion's job is just more, more or less ceremonial. He just sticks around and defends the pride while the females do all the work. I must admit, it's not exactly uh, the best balance of power, but you know, if it works for a lion, then whatever. Another thing about lions is that about 80% of the time, their day is spent resting. That is to conserve any energy, uh, any energy that they may have. Because when you're, when you're living on the African plains, you gotta deal with a lot of fast food. And I'm not talking about burgers and fries or milkshakes. We're dealing with, an, with animals like antelope or wildebeests that will immediately run, the, run away at the sight of a lion. Now, lions are also sexually dimorphic, which means that you can tell the males from the females. The male always wears that handsome old mane, so you, de so you can definitely tell who's who. These next animals are rear rip. Oh, sorry. Get ready to meet some friends from the land down under, mates. I'm talking about kangaroos. Now, there are two species of kangaroo housed at the Potter Park Zoo. They include the red kangaroo and the eastern gray kangaroo. Now, interestingly enough, only the male red kangaroo has a red coat. Females, for the most part, tend to remain gray, although sometimes they do show um, variants with red fur, particularly in the outback. Now, these animals are also what are known as marsupials or pouch-bearing mammals. Most of the world's marsupials can be found in Australia, and these are only two of the many out there. And what's special about uh, marsupials is that when their offspring are born, they are no bigger than the size of a jelly bean. So for the most part of their infant life, the joeys are spend time developing in the pouch nursing from their mother's milk. Now, by the age of six months, they are fully developed and start venturing out of the pouch. Two or three months afterwards, they will keep venturing in and out of the pouch until mom says, hey, enough is enough, time to move on your own. Now, if you take a look at, um, at their legs, you'll notice that they don't pivot independently like ours. That is why you see them hopping a lot, because that's the only way that they are able to get around. They cannot, they cannot move their legs much like other mammals can. So hopping is the best way to do it. Now you'll also notice sometimes that they will stand with their tail on the ground. The tail is also pretty useful as it is very strong and serves as almost like a third leg. But kangaroos are also famous for is boxing. Now boxing is a behavior that normally occurs, occurs with males. Most of the time that is when they're either fighting for mates or fighting for dominance or even defending themselves from other creatures. And if you've seen a kangaroo kick, well, it's a pretty awesome sight they will stand on their tails and actually lift their legs off the ground and then make a large kick. In fact, that kick is so strong that it is able to snap a human back. So you definitely don't want to be there on the receiving end of one of those. Behind me are two of the Potter Park Zoo's three black rhinoceroses. The big one, that's Mother Dopsy, and, and the little one is Jolly, her baby. Now, Jolly holds a special place in the hearts of, of many at the Potter Park Zoo and of Lansing. He was the first black rhino to ever be born in the Potter Park Zoo's 100 year history. On Christmas Eve of 2019, Jolly came into this world a victory in the conservation efforts of black rhinos. Now, what's also special is that Potter Park Zoo is currently the only accredited zoo in Michigan that breeds black rhinos. So it's very important that uh, we have these rhinos here as they are gonna be an important step in conserving this critically endangered species. Now the biggest, um, the biggest threat to rhinos is um, poaching for the ivory trade. That horn is really sought after on the black market and goes for like 
I don't know how many dollars, but quite a lot. But it's really sad to know that, um, that this species is in decline, mainly because, of, mainly because of that poaching. Their horns are made out of a substance called keratin, which also makes up our hair and fingernails. They're primarily used to defend against threats. And that's interesting too because rhinos are one of the few animals in the world that don't have natural predators. That horn is scary enough to ward off even the most fierce cats. And another thing, another thing that I'm going to note is that um, Jolly is eventually going to be moving to another zoo later this fall to meet, to meet another young female. And hopefully in the future, we might see Jolly become a father himself. We'll definitely keep an eye open for that.